All right. So, um, hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Andrea Pop, and I support outreach activities for the National Science Foundation's Policy Office. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you today to the Fall 2023 NSF Virtual Grants Conference. I am now pleased to present this session, which will cover NSF's Directorate for Geosciences. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the part of the Grants Conference where we tell you a little about the Directorate for Geosciences, or GEO. I'm Jennifer Wade, and I'm a program director in the Petrology and Geochemistry program, which is in the Division of Earth Sciences. Today, we'll talk about where GEO fits in the context of NSF and how it's structured. I'll highlight some opportunities within GEO and across NSF and talk briefly about the merit review process. So let's start with GEO. As you likely know, NSF is divided into directorates, and each directorate supports research, education, and facilities in their given domain, like biological sciences, engineering, and the most recent directorate, technology, innovation, and partnerships. In GEO, our mission is focused on ways to understand and adapt to changes in our Earth, ocean, and atmosphere from its origin into the future. It's to accelerate the societal benefits of our investments and to train a diverse and inclusive workforce for geosciences. So GEO is divided into five parts, the divisions of Earth, Oceans, and Atmospheric and Geospace Sciences, the Office of Polar Programs, and a new division to GEO called RISE, Research, Innovation, Synergies, and Education. I'm going to walk through each one so you understand a little bit about how each part of GEO contributes. So we'll start with EAR, since that's the division I'm in. EAR is interested in the structure, composition, and evolution of the Earth all the way from the tree canopy down through the soils into the crust, mantle, and core of our planet. And we support field work, theoretical and computational work, experiments, and a range of infrastructure and facilities. Like many divisions, EAR is divided into sections, and those sections house the programs that you actually submit proposals to. So in EAR, for example, we're divided into the disciplinary programs uh, and integrated activities. The disciplinary programs are what some folks refer to as the core programs, uh, and you can learn more about each of those on the division's website. The programs and integrated activities are sort of cross-cutting and aren't really discipline specific. So programs like the postdoc fellowships or geoinformatics live here. Things are organized a little differently in polar programs. So they're mostly divided geographically into the Antarctic and the Arctic, although there are some programs that cut across all polar research like those focused on cyber infrastructure, and like EAR, the postdoc fellowship program. So not only do those programs support research and education in the Arctic and the Antarctic, OPP also provides logistical and operational support for work in remote locations in both regions. Okay, AGS supports research to understand a range of processes, including space weather, tropospheric weather, air quality, and of course, climate. AGS is divided into three sections, and you can see the programs housed in each. So atmosphere and geospace sections cover the obvious domains, and the facilities section houses NCAR, uh, the education programs, and numerous observing and lab facilities. OCE supports ocean research, of course, and the ocean's interactions with the Earth and the atmosphere. OCE is divided into three parts, too the ocean section where biological and physical oceanography live, the marine geosciences section where chemical oceanography and marine geology and geophysics live, and then the integrative section which houses education and the major shared use oceanographic facilities like ships, submersibles, and other observatories. I always, always, I always like to point out here, uh, if you study organisms that live either in the ocean or the polar regions, you actually come to programs within the Geosciences Directorate for support and not biological sciences. And now we've come to GEO's newest division, RISE. RISE is focused on partnership projects in both research and education that really cut across traditional boundaries within the geosciences. RISE will support a range of programs, including those focused on cyber infrastructure, education, diversity, equity and inclusion, global climate challenges, innovation, 
partnerships, synergies, other cross foundation efforts, basically, that cross cut the rest of GEO and encourage interdisciplinary approaches that respond to the needs of the geosciences community. I've mentioned facilities a few times. GEO really recognizes that often researchers are asking questions that require specialized tools um, and facilities for observing, analyzing data, modeling, uh, that might be too large for one scientist to manage. And so GEO's investment in facilities is really broad, and they're used by many institutions and investigators to address their own specific questions. So these include things like South Pole Station, the research vessels, sample and data repositories, and many others, and you can learn about them on the GEO website. So often we not only support data collection, but also data management and computational abilities that are really fundamental to making sure the research supported by NSF can be accessed and used to the fullest extent. So you've likely heard this year about the Chips and Science Act. I wanna talk about it a little bit. This act was passed in August of 22, and it's super important to the future of NSF. So the Chips and Science Act basically gave authorization to double NSF's budget over five years. And this has a lot of long-term implications and of course has impacted NSF's plans for strengthening fundamental research into the future. For GEO, the focus of that strengthening includes areas like hazards risk and resilience, climate change, and the critical minerals and materials needed for green technology. So by establishing the directorate that I mentioned earlier, the Technology Innovation and Partnerships, or TIP, CHIPS really helps strengthen that cross-disciplinary work, like exploring how technology can extend geoscience research through robotic exploration and AI, along with ensuring societal needs are met through strengthening food, energy, and water infrastructure. Importantly, CHIPS also emphasizes advancing diversity in STEM. So it's clear the future sustainability and prosperity of society requires a transdisciplinary geoscience workforce that reflects the nation's diversity and has the capacity to develop innovative solutions. So CHIPS allows us to put more funding into making geosciences welcoming to members of groups that have been historically excluded or marginalized and to build an inclusive space where innovative research can thrive. So programs in RISE and really in all of the divisions are helping to meet those goals. So I've mentioned a lot of divisions and programs and themes, and you might be thinking, where do I fit in? Which program is right for me? So we always encourage you to reach out to a program director and ask the questions that you have, but maybe you don't even know which program to reach out to. So I encourage you to go to nsf.gov, come up here to find funding and apply, and then you can click over here to search funded projects. And you just type in a keyword or phrase, something that relates to what you do, and it'll pull up a list of awards that NSF has made. And as you click on each, you can read an abstract of the work, see how much money they were awarded, and most importantly, see which program funded that work. So now you'll have a better sense of where you might submit and also who to go with, go to with questions, uh, because as you'll hear often from us and from me today, if you're ever uncertain, talk to a program director. Um, and when I say program director, program officer, PD, PO, they all mean the same thing. Okay, so whether it's through new partnerships created by CHIPS or through a core program in ocean sciences, all of these parts of GEO and the rest of NSF are here to support your research and education. And we've talked about the sort of discipline-focused programs in GEO and its structure, but I want to talk about a few other opportunities across NSF. So the Geosciences Directorate engages in programs across NSF that invest in our research community at every career stage. So the Graduate Research Fellowship Program provides a stipend and educational allowance directly to the student. And the website's in the box there, nsfgrfp.org. Almost every part of GEO has a postdoc fellowship program. Uh, the details really vary depending on if you're in earth sciences or another division, but take a look at those. And of course, talk to the program director if you have questions. Uh, for pre-tenure researchers, the NSF-wide career program provides five years and at least $500,000 for PIs who are engaged in the true integration of research and education. And for those who are mid-career, NSF has a program that provides protected time and resources to gain new skills in a mentored partnership. The solicitation numbers are listed here, and I'm going to post them in the chat as well, um, so you can learn more. 
Within GEO, there are a few other opportunities that you might be interested in. So GLOW, or Geoscience Lessons for and from Other Worlds, is a collaboration with astronomy, uh, trying to support the work that sort of falls in between NASA and NSF. So if you're doing work that, say, uses exoplanet data to understand the origin of the Earth, or vice versa, you might be right for GLOW. In response to Chips and Science, GEO also released a Dear Colleague letter, or DCL, about critical minerals research. So if you're interested in that, take a look. And again, the numbers are on the right, and I'll post these in the chat too. Next is GEO Embrace. So this solicitation invites proposals from non-R1 institutions, especially minority-serving institutions, community colleges, emerging research institutions, to submit uh, for some special support. So this is really aimed at mitigating the multiple barriers faced by geoscience faculty at non-R1 institutions when submitting uh, proposals and obtaining federal funding. And the last category on this slide is broadly research instrumentation and infrastructure. So several divisions have programs you can explore to support instrumentation and facilities, and GEO really participates uh, a lot in the NSF-wide competitions for major and mid-scale research infrastructure as well. The last set of opportunities I want to highlight today are what we call lead agency agreements. So each of these sets up a sort of flexible pathway to allow proposers from the US and other countries uh, to submit a joint proposal that undergoes a single review process through the lead agency. So these are not the only way for NSF PIs to engage in foreign collaboration. Uh, plenty of regular proposals involve international collaboration in a variety of ways. But these really provide a formal structure that allows for strong and sometimes equal partnerships across the nations. And it's important to know some are broad and some are sort of topic specific. Um, so be sure to read the links that we provide for these. And of course, it's always good to talk to a program director before you embark on one of these lead agency projects. Okay, now I know earlier in the grants conference, you became experts in merit review, but I wanna highlight a few things today. As you know, all NSF proposals are evaluated based on two merit review criteria intellectual merit and the broader impacts. And I think folks have an easy time envisioning the intellectual merit of most projects because it's the potential to advance knowledge, right? The fundamental reason for the work that you're likely doing. But what about broader impacts, right? The potential to benefit society. We often hear that these are harder to understand. And so I wanna provide some examples that we've seen in proposals to GEO. So these are just example categories, but let's talk about them. So broader impacts activities could be teaching and training of undergrads or grad students. Uh, your work could be broadening the participation of people who have historically been excluded from geosciences. You could be building partnerships, maybe locally, maybe internationally. You could be disseminating information broadly for the public, either on your own or with a museum. You could be building laboratories that uh, you'll open to small colleges nearby or building infrastructure in a developing country. Or you could be doing work that's really going to impact policy at some level. So these aren't the only broader impacts that exist, of course, but they're intended to just sort of get you thinking. And if you take anything away from this section, I hope it is this, that it's better to do one or two of these really well than to try to do them all that not every PI or institution is well suited for the same broader impact, and that the broader impacts really should be integrated and meaningful and not tacked on at the end. So while I'm on this topic, let me share a little more advice as you start writing your proposals to GEO. Make sure your maps, your figures, your captions are all clearly readable, not so tiny that a reviewer or me has to struggle to read it. Lay out a clear work plan and timeline and make sure it's clear who's doing what on the project. Develop a realistic budget and use the pages that we give you to justify it. We know science costs money, that's our job, but tell us why you need what you need. And on that topic, ask for money for your broader impacts activities. And I'm gonna put what I call my eruption for emphasis here because we don't expect you to do science for free. We also don't expect you or your collaborators to achieve those great broader impacts for free either. And lastly, make sure someone else reads your proposal before you submit it, not just your research office, right? Find a trusted colleague or friend to tell you, does your work plan make sense? 
Are they excited by the ideas? Can they read your map legend? Once you've submitted your proposal and it's undergone merit review, I hope you know that a lot of thoughtful consideration goes into every decision we make in GEO. We don't just look at the reviewer scores and say, great, we're going to fund the top projects until we run out of money. We consider the potential for real transformative impact in both science and society. Maybe there's an agency or administration priority the work meets. We want to fund a diverse range of PIs and students, as well as a range of institution types. We are the National Science Foundation, and so we think a lot about geographic diversity. Are we funding the whole nation? We want to fund not just senior PIs or early career folks, but a range of career stages. And we want to support our international partnerships, and we want to reward those with strong records of mentorship. All of this and more goes into our decision making across the Directorate for Geosciences. So we covered a lot today uh, from what GEO is and how we're structured, some opportunities to explore, and a little bit about merit review in our corner of NSF. There is a lot to learn about the NSF process. Um, almost every part of GEO has a newsletter that you can subscribe to for news and updates, and you can find those at nsf.gov. One of the best ways uh, to learn is to be a part of the merit review process. And so you can sign up here at this QR code to be a panelist or reviewer. Expert feedback is really essential to the process, making sure that we're funding strong proposals, but this can really also help you learn how proposals are assessed and being a panelist really gives you the opportunity connect, to connect with others in your field. Uh, GEO has some other outreach posted at nsf.gov slash geo slash outreach. And with that, I am very happy to take some questions. All right. So um, Jennifer and Lena, if you want to come on screen, um, we would like to open the floor for any questions. I don't see any in the Q&A right now, um, but uh, Jennifer, I know you said that you might want to expand on a couple of topics. So maybe while people are thinking of their questions, you can uh, cover that and then we can look at Q&A. Sure. So one of the things that, um... Uh, well, first, let me introduce myself and my my colleague who's here. So I'm I'm Jennifer Wade. I'm as a, as you just heard, one of the program directors in the Division of Earth Sciences. Uh, and I have Lena here with me uh, to help answer some of those questions. Lena, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Jennifer. Lena Patino. I'm a program director in the Division for Research, Innovation, Synergies, and Education. Our new Rise Division. It's very exciting. Um, so a couple of things I know I see there are a couple of questions coming in that we will answer, um, but a couple of things I also wanted to to raise that didn't make it into the presentation. We talked a lot about um, submitting new proposals and uh, and opportunities for new funding, but we also didn't want to forget to mention that if if you or your PIs have existing awards. And we have a lot of uh, supplemental opportunities to add on to some things uh, to existing awards. So some of the most common supplements uh, in our NGO are include one called intern. Actually, Lena, if you could find one of the intern. Uh, oh, wait, I know what I have. I have the, a list of where the intern supplements are all listed right in front of me. Um, these are for graduate students who want to do an internship uh, outside of academia, so maybe um, at a museum or in industry or at the USGS. Um, I'm going to paste this in the, they're listed here on this list of many DCL opportunities, but um, I wanted to mention that um, intern is a great thing for students who are interested in sort of exploring uh, what they can do other than an academic position. Um, there are also research experience for undergraduates supplement opportunities, which are great for, um, say you have a student in your class, an undergrad who is really promising and, and wants to get involved in research. A lot of programs can um, supplement awards uh, to support those students. So I just, I didn't wanna forget to mention those. Um, and now I will turn to the questions that have come in. Now I see that there are many. Uh, yeah, yes. Andrea, would you like to lead yeah. us through some of these? Sure. So thank you for your questions. Um, our first question is, um, what qualifications do you require to be a reviewer or panelist? That's a great question. What are the requirements? Uh, be an expert in your field, really. <laughs> um, and it could be, and uh, 
so we look for reviewers when I get a proposal in, um, as I'm sure you learned in the merit review session yesterday, um, we evaluate both the intellectual merit and the broader impacts. And so we like to find reviewers who are um, who are experts maybe in the methods that are being used in a project um, or that are experts in the broader impacts activities. Like if the proposal involves say building a museum exhibit, um, we might reach out to a reviewer who has expertise in, in that specific area. And um, usually in terms of you know, technical qualifications, we usually use folks with a PhD, um, postdocs and higher. We use, most programs use folks both from the US and uh, some international people. Um, but it's really about finding the, that that really can vary. It depends on what your expertise and experience is. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have a certain degree level um, to review something. Often I find the graduate students <laughs> and the early career postdocs are the closest experts in many things. Um, and in partnerships with industry, sometimes the, the folks who are best positioned to evaluate those kinds of proposals, uh, yeah, have a different, have different, the word qualifications can mean a lot of different things. I don't know, Lena, did you have anything to add to that? No, Jennifer, just that the PhD is not required in all the areas, right? There are some aspects of um, uh, museum exhibits, outreach, um, different types of programs. So it depends on the program, but if you're interested in reviewing for NSF, approach us and we will, uh, there was a QRL code in the presentation if you wanted to sign up to be a reviewer. Okay, great. Um, so the next question we have, uh, what size grant does GEO expect to include external evalu evaluation versus internal evaluation? Sure. So all of this is laid out in the uh, the PAP guide, the uh, NSF proposal policies and proposal and award policy and procedures guide, PAPPG. Um, so for um, for no matter what the scale. If it's a regular proposal to NSF that comes in, um, almost every program will will put it out for external review. So, for example, in my program, um, whether it's a small eighty thousand dollar project or a, a eight hundred thousand dollar project, we'll probably get external review for it because we need to follow the merit review criteria that's laid out by the science board. But there are a few specific categories of proposals um, that may not. Uh, that don't necessarily fall into that. So workshop proposals, if they're less than $50,000, um, we don't have to review them uh, at all other than internally. Um, things that are between 50 and 100K, we do internally. And then if it's more than that, we do externally. So there are all a few different ranges, but that's mostly dependent on what kind of proposal. So workshop proposal. Rapid proposals, um, which are rapid response projects um, don't need to go through external review, though we can if we want to. Um, and eagers, which are sort of early concept grants, uh, also don't necessarily need to go out for external review unless we want to. So it's sort of about scale, but it's more about what kind of proposal uh, are you submitting. Okay. Um, and then the next question is, do you weigh the importance of addressing large regional challenges in your review of projects? So somebody said, for example, transformational science. I, want, I need to like read the words for that one one more time. Okay. Do you weigh the importance of large regional challenges. Uh, so to me, those are sort of two different things. Uh, I'm gonna let Lena take a stab at this first. So large regional challenge versus transformational. Lena, what's your take on this one? My take on it, it depends on the solicitation, right? So each solicitation has a set of goals and in some cases additional review criteria. So if the goals of the solicitation talk about need to address large regional challenges, then that is weighted significantly. But if it is not, for example, I'm a petrologist, I studied volcanic rocks. I didn't have to talk about regional challenges when I submitted my proposal when I was a researcher. So it depends on the solicitation. Again, align the proposals to the goal of the solicitation. Great. Um, so I will move on to the next question. 
Um, so regarding broader impacts, do geo panels favor new BI initiatives over continuation of existing successful BI programs? So it, re it really depends. In, the pro in a program, we want to fund a broad portfolio of broader impacts activities. So new and innovative uh, ideas are always welcome, absolutely. But you want to make sure that you convey that they're doable and accessible. So how are you going to assess the impact of what you're proposing to do? But that's we'd certainly want to fund uh, some new things. Otherwise, the the concept of broader impacts and how our science impacts society wouldn't evolve, right? So we need some of that. At the same time, there are some really wonderful broader impacts activities that we do want to see continue or evolve. And it's a real strength if you have been successful in the broader impact space and you're talking in your new proposal about how you're going to take what you've learned from that activity and build on it, or you're using that as part of your record, like in your results from prior support, you have to talk about your intellectual merit and broader impacts of prior support. And if you have an example there of something that's really strong, that's a strength if you're proposing to build on the strong thing that you've done in the past. So I don't think, and again, unless there might be a solicitation that specifically asks for innovative, broader impacts in a specific way, um, then you wanna make sure you are proposing innovative broader impacts. I can think of a few, um, but in a regular research program like, like mine, um, we'd like to, we wanna fund a balance of those things. All right. Um, and if you want to conduct research on environmental disaster and how it can affect the surrounding community, which program would you suggest? So depends on what that disaster is um, and what the goal of that research is. So this, I will say, reach out to the program directors um, of whatever field you're in. If you're working on uh, an oil spill in the Gulf Coast, you'll want to reach out to the ocean sciences program directors and ask them this question. Um, it really depends uh, on what you're doing. This is one of the places I think it's super useful to go to the um, NSF award search. If you go to nsf.gov, there's a section where you can just search awards and search for the keyword on the kind of thing you're interested in studying. And that will bring up a list of all of the projects that have been funded in that area, and you can see which programs fund it and reach out to them if you're not sure um, from the beginning. There also may be, sometimes there are special opportunities announced via Dear Colleague Letters at NSF. If there's a disaster, I mean, I hope this doesn't happen, but it probably will. So there's something large enough that NSF will put out a special opportunity um, to submit to, so you can keep your eye out for those as well. Okay. Um, if you had an idea for a project and a sampling plan that requires time on a large vessel, but only a small team, what would the best way to go forward? What would be the best way to go forward to arrange collaborations with other potential projects? Does NSF have a tool for that? So this is another opportunity for me to say, reach out to the program. <laughs> um, there. The, the way ship time is allocated, there's a there's a great group of people in the Division of Ocean Sciences who who know which cruises are coming up and um, and can help you navigate how to figure out where you should be. There are also some um, big community efforts that have that publicly talk about, uh, hey, we're going on this cruise, we're sailing and we have X number of slots available for people to sign up to join. And so um, keeping an eye out for those uh, are super useful as well. But it always starts with program director in ocean sciences. Okay. Um, and I do just want to remind folks, if you um, do have more questions, please go ahead and submit those. Um, but the, the next question, um, could you please discuss a bit of the distinction between the field safety plan that is required for submission in some solicitations and the safe and inclusive research plan being piloted in GEO as a result of PAPPG 23-1. Yes, so the safe and inclusive plan is required for anyone doing off-campus research, and that's up to your institution to certify whether the research is off-campus or not. And uh, that really is about, a, it's a safe and inclusive plan that's focused on harassment, really, fundamentally. 
Um, and only a few solicitations require that you actually submit that plan to be reviewed. There's a pilot that's happening for a few programs in geo and in bio, biological sciences. Um, but it's mostly a checkbox that your institution is certifying that you have that plan uh, for the project. In the Division of Earth Sciences, a couple of programs, including mine, Petrology and Geochemistry, uh, requires, if you're doing field work, a field safety protocol that describes how you will um, ensure the physical and mental safety of students uh, and faculty, anyone who is involved in a field project, um, whether you're, you know, hiking up an active volcano or taking a number of black and brown students out into a rural white place and exposing them to things that they may not be comfortable with. And so those are, that is required to be uh, currently in those, in a few solicitations included in the project description of the proposal. So those are two different things. One is really um, focused, especially on physical safety and the safe and inclusive plan is really about harassment and is uh, more institution at the institution level than the project level. All right. Um, next question. Um, if you are researching lithium extraction, would you look at, would you look to NSF Geo or the Department of Energy? So it depends on what you're interested in, in lithium extraction. So um, if you are looking at the fundamental uh, development via igneous and or metamorphic processes of lithium, in source rocks, you probably are coming to the Division of Earth Sciences. If you're interested in the physical extraction of lithium from rocks, you're probably in NSF engineering, or you might be in Department of Energy. They do have some programs that are, uh, are focused on critical mineral, critical element, um, extraction processing and uh, and resource development. So it's always important to read the solicitation really carefully. This is a pl place where you could go to grants.gov. We talked about that in the um, first session of, of proposal prep on day one. Um, grants searching for uh, keywords on grants.gov really shows you the whole government landscape of grants programs, not just NSF. And so that can sometimes help you um, figure out where you fit. But again, it's also an opportunity if you think it's if you think it might be earth sciences petrology, you can send me a one pager and I can read it and tell you, <laughs> yes, this is us or no, it is not. OK, um, so we did get a couple more questions in. So we just take a quick look at those. Um, I think Lena could answer this one uh, from Tatiana. Could you read that okay, one? Okay, great, of course. Um, let's see. So how is it possible to get funding for writing a book which would summarize the current knowledge in a certain science and can be used by scientists, engineers, and students in collaboration with possibly up to 50 scientists across the world? Does NSF provide funding for such projects? So oh, this is a, a difficult one because the answer, as it is described there, will be no, right? There is a there is not a research project that is being described. It's looking for specific uh, product uh, result that it is. Now, person could partner with others and maybe as an outcome of, of another project as the broader impacts, that can be a possibility. But as it's described there, I think it has to be a research project or in responding to a specific solicitation that will do it. But right now, no solicitation comes to mind that funds just authorship of books. Jen? I agree. All right. Um, and so it does look like another question. Um, so any comments or suggestions if proposal topic is interdisciplinary? Um, and you all have to excuse me. This is not my my area of expertise, but like uh, paleo bathy bathymetry. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, reconstruction with paleo simulation simulations using GCMS. How to approach these types of funding opportunities and how to find relevant funding pools. 
So I can take this one. So interdisciplinary proposals, that's, um, those are very interesting projects. And I think that um, the recommendation that I will have for this particular one in paleobathymetry, right? Maybe is reaching out to uh, program directors in marine geology and geophysics program, for example, or in the same entry geology and paleobiology program in the Directorate for Geosciences. Those two specific programs will be a starting point. And then they may recommend based on that one pager that Jennifer mentioned earlier, they can recommend one program over the other or programs can agree to co-review if there is not an interdisciplinary program that could address it. Uh, P4 climate is another one that comes to mind that may be um, relevant. Again, just with the sentences there. Um, but, um, and then as Jennifer mentioned earlier, uh, the award database can be a very useful tool as you're trying to find a home for a particular idea. You can just use keywords there and then you will see uh, different awards and it will include the program that funded those awards in the abstract page. Hey. Um, and I'm I'm not seeing any additional questions. Um, so before we close out, though, I just Jennifer wanted to give you opportunity to address anything that might have been missed. Sure, I just saw one that um, we can sort of speak to in a broad sense. So the question is: as the food, water, energy funding increases, what sorts of priorities do you see for this sort of program? And I don't know that I can speak to exactly this topic, but I think. Um, and maybe Lena can, uh, but I think broadly when, you know, NSF is putting out, uh, dear colleague letters and notices about new programs, uh, all the time. And that will often tell you an indication of, of where some priorities are. So I really encourage folks to sign up for, uh, the alerts that are really that are geo specific. You can you can sign up for alerts at nsf.gov um, and be notified when something when a priority is released and NSF puts some funding behind it. Um, you'll be the first to hear about it because you get these notifications. And so it's really hard for us to predict. Um, you know, with this new directorate that we have, technology innovation and partnerships, with this new division which Lena is in sort of there's a lot of opportunity ahead we don't necessarily always know where it's going to be <laughs> and what it's going to look like um but you know i've been here for 13 years and i've watched so many things uh evolve and so i think signing up for those this is just my pitch about um signing up for those alerts to sort of see what are the what are the things that nsf is putting out um and a lot of things won't just be geo related either i think there's more and more interaction between geo and biological sciences with engineering with technology innovation and partnerships and that's some where some of the really exciting new stuff is coming so there might be some cool food water energy stuff come in that space um lena anything anything come to mind for you um okay there's also a question about um this is very, this is sort of logistical, but can you submit proposals to a, a specific section? I think you mean program, if you're a panelist in another program of the same directorate. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, you absolutely can. Um, yeah, th there's no restriction on that. Um, if I have a proposal in from you, I won't put you on a panel in that same program, but it doesn't stop you from serving elsewhere across uh, the agency. Yeah, okay. Lena, any other messages that we wanted to convey today that we've left out? Uh, not uh, that you left out, but just to emphasize, reading the solicitation, their dear colleague letter carefully. Sometimes we wanna see, we have an idea and we wanna see an opportunity and we just see kind of through and we don't really pay close attention to the goals of the solicitation. So paying very close attention to the goals of the solicitations of dear colleague letters are out. Um, as Jennifer indicated, new divisions, new directorates, there will be new opportunities, some, ty some types of opportunities that may look new to NSF. 
and um, encourage you to take a look at it, reach out to the program directors assigned to it. And I just want to make a, a pitch to an uh, uh, activity that I'm engaged um, nowadays, and it's a new supplement opportunity. And it is to support people with disabilities um, in um, STEM. So I will, as, as Jennifer does, I will put the, uh, the link to that DCL out um, because we're promoting and we want to include as many people um, in science. We know that a wide range of people have great ideas. We want to make sure that they have the opportunity to participate. That's great. Thanks for that, Lena. Um, the one last question just came in about how to be a new reviewer. And so uh, I flashed this QR code briefly during the presentation, but I'll paste the link uh, in the chat there uh, to sign up to be a reviewer. There's a um, link at the top of this page that will take you. Um, you just fill out some information about yourself and your expertise, and um, that's one way to do it. You can also just uh, if you know exactly which program you're interested in reviewing for, you can send those program directors uh, your CV and say, hello, introduce yourself, send it and say, I'd love to be a reviewer. Uh, we love getting those emails. They make us very happy. <laughs> so, uh, great. Okay. Um, well, with that, um, I think that we can wrap up a little bit early. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. Um, have a great rest of your day and goodbye.